Despite the high price, FPGA gaming is gaining in popularity, and not everybody thinks it's worth the money. But there's a new player in town that's looking to split the difference between affordability and experience. This is the Funny Playing FPGA Game Boy Color, and today I'm going to take a look at how it stacks up. It's no secret that I love new retro gaming technologies, and FPGAs in particular really fascinate me. When it comes to handhelds, I own quite a few handheld gaming devices. But over the past several months, the one device that's gotten the most use from me has been my Analog Pocket. Now, Analog has done a good job at overcoming many of the challenges they've experienced early on, but it's still an expensive device. So I was excited to hear that Funny Playing was releasing a more affordable alternative, the Funny Playing Game Boy Color. I think there's definitely a market out there for a lower cost, less capable FPGA handheld. Unfortunately though, there isn't a lot of information out there about the specs in this device. But don't worry, because I've examined this board closely and I'm gonna take you through what I've discovered. A lot of people are asking, how does this compare to the analog pocket? But I have to say that it isn't really a fair comparison. Now, don't get me wrong, some of the features are similar. A USB-C port for charging the built-in lithium polymer battery, the ability to play original Game Boy and Game Boy Color cartridges, and an upgraded backlit screen. But that's about where the similarities end, because unlike the analog pocket, the funny playing FPGA looks like an actual Game Boy Color. And because of that, it only has the two A and B buttons versus the pocket's four buttons and two rear triggers. And on top of that, notably missing is a micro SD card slot or really any storage expansion option. But what about the underlying hardware? As I discussed previously in my analog pocket teardown, the pocket has a Cyclone 5 FPGA that's driving its game cores with 49,000 logic elements. The funny playing device, however, uses a GoIn GWAR series FPGA. Now, it's a little challenging to do an adequate comparison of FPGAs from different manufacturers because the architecture of each FPGA differs, as well as the marketing lingo. But to give you an idea of the difference, the GoIn FPGA used by the funny playing device has the model number LV18EQ144. If you look at the datasheet, you'll see that the 18 means that there's 20,736 lookup tables in this chip. These GoIn chips refer to their logic units as configurable function units or CFUs. Each CFU consists of a routing block and four configurable logic sections. And each of these four sections has two lookup tables, each with four inputs. Now, I said earlier that the Cyclone 5 has 49,000 logic elements, but that's actually not 100% accurate. The logic elements building block was used in other Cyclone chip designs, but the Cyclone 5 uses a different building block called the Adaptive Logic Module, or ALM. And if you look at the datasheet, you'll see that there's 18,480 ALMs in the Cyclone 5, which is equivalent to about 49,000 logic elements. But the ALMs in the Cyclone chip are very different from the CFUs in the GoIn. Rather than having multiple four input lookup tables, an ALM has a single lookup table with eight inputs. So you can't really make an apples to apples comparison between these two chips. If I had to estimate though, you could say that one Cyclone logic element could be roughly compared to one GoIn lookup table. And by that measure, the analog pocket is two to two and a half times more powerful than the funny playing FPGBC. But aside from the FPGA, there's also a 32-bit RISC microcontroller on board 
which runs the underlying operating system on this device. This MCU is made by WCH, and its model number is CH32V203. It runs at 144 MHz and has built-in power management, a real-time clock, and bus interfaces, including two I2C interfaces, two SPI interfaces, and USB 2.0. So when you plug your Funny Playing GBC into your computer to update the firmware, you're communicating with its microcontroller over USB. The display is really interesting. This doesn't look to be a screen that Funny Playing sells with any of its other upgrade kits. Funny Playing doesn't provide any specs about the screen, but I put it under the microscope and found that it has a 720 by 648 resolution. Now, this is a bit of an odd resolution, but it makes sense for the Game Boy. The original Game Boy display is 160 by 144 pixels, and that gives it a 10 to 9 aspect ratio. And if you do the math, you'll see that the 720 by 648 pixel funny playing display is also that same 10 to 9 aspect ratio. But it's not a perfect integer scaling of the Game Boy screen. Instead, it's a 4.5 pixel scale. In other words, every one pixel on the original Game Boy is represented as either 4 pixels or 5 pixels on the funny playing Game Boy Color. To understand this better, here's an original unmodified Game Boy Color screen under the microscope. Notice that each letter in this text is an 8 pixel by 8 pixel grid. Now here's the funny playing Game Boy Color. Notice that the same letter is 36 by 36 pixels. So there is a scaling algorithm at play here when it's being used in full screen mode. Now I noticed that this screen does not have its own driver board. It connects to the main PCB directly with a ribbon cable. And there aren't any display driver chips on the main PCB. But after closer inspection, I discovered that the screen's ribbon cable connector does route directly to the FPGA. So this tells us that the FPGA isn't only running the Game Boy Core, but it's also emulating the display driver. Now remember that FPGAs themselves are stateless. You have to configure it before you can use it. So the code that configures the FPGA has to be stored somewhere. And so you would expect to find some sort of flash storage on the device. And that's exactly what you'll find hidden near the cartridge slot. This is a two megabyte flash chip. Now I didn't dump the chip, so I don't know exactly what's on here, but I would assume that it at least has the Game Boy FPGA core. The weaker FPGA and the lack of features really seals this in as a modern Game Boy replacement and not a general purpose FPGA handheld. Without a storage expansion option, there's nowhere to place ROM files, and having only two buttons really limits the number of game systems that you can emulate. So with that in mind, I think it's unlikely that we'll see other non-Game Boy FPGA cores ported over to this device. I think it's fair to say that this funny playing FPGA handheld is squarely in the camp of being a new alternative to the classic Game Boy and Game Boy Color. And if that's what you're looking for, then this device isn't a bad deal. At a cost of only $70, it's cheaper to buy this FPGA kit than purchasing a used Game Boy Color along with a screen replacement, battery, and USB mod. And yes, I said kit, because this device does come as a kit that you have to assemble yourself. It's pretty simple though. There's no soldering, and once you know how to do it, you can get it together in less than 15 minutes. And I happen to have an extra kit right here. So let's walk through the process of putting it together. When you purchase the kit from Funny Playing, it comes with the main board, an 1800 milliamp hour battery, a two watt speaker, and the new display. You'll also wanna purchase one of their replacement shells and a set of buttons. The replacement shell is similar to the standard Game Boy Color shell, but with three important distinctions. First, there's a larger cutout for the screen. Second, there's a cutout in the bottom for the USB-C port. And finally, the separator in the battery compartment was removed so you can fit in the LiPo battery pack. 
If you wanted to, you could modify a stock Game Boy shell to fit the screen, the USB port, and the battery. But you'll have to cut away quite a bit of plastic to do so. But if you use their aftermarket shell, everything just drops right into place without any hassle. Well worth the extra $10 in my opinion. Okay, so we'll start off by removing the backing from the tape and dropping the screen into the front half of the shell. There's a possibility that the pins on the cartridge slot could short out against the back side of the screen. So we'll add some Kapton tape across the screen as a safety measure. Next, we'll drop in the buttons, the speaker, and the rubber domes. Then we'll attach the cable from the screen to the connector on the mainboard. And the mainboard gets attached to the front shell with the three Phillips head screws. We can then go ahead and plug in the speaker and drop in the top cover as well as the sliding button for the power switch. Then we'll add on the back half of the shell and screw it down with the remaining six tri-wing screws. Finally, we'll connect the battery and stuff it into the battery compartment before putting on the door. From the outside, it does look an awful lot like a standard Game Boy Color. But once you turn it on, it's clear that this is no Game Boy. If you press in the volume button on the side, you get a menu that lets you adjust some settings. It's here that you can change the screen mode from full screen to a 4x integer scaled resolution. But aside from the upgraded screen and speaker, it pretty much feels like a standard Game Boy Color. Except that not every game works. I was really disappointed when I tried to fire up one of my favorite Game Boy games, Alleyway. It starts up fine, but the bumper immediately drifts to the left and the D-pad does nothing. To be fair, this is the only game that I found with this problem, but I've only played about a dozen games on this device. I don't know, maybe I just got unlucky and stumbled upon the only game that doesn't work on the funny playing Game Boy. I'm curious to hear about your own experiences. If you have one of these and you found other games that haven't worked, let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, let me know what else you like or don't like about this device. Overall, I think it's a neat device and it hits the right price point. I'm still holding out hope for a more general purpose FPGA handheld in this price range, but I do think products like this give us some hope that this technology will become more accessible to the standard consumer. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing for more of this type of video. And as always, until next time, go make something cool.